Well, good afternoon and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jason Fisher, your host today. And today's topic is bobcats in the bush. I've done a couple of wildlife uh, series on these videos in the past uh, and had a request to do this one. And so enjoy the footage we're going to show you uh, that's been captured and obtained from a friend of mine, as well as some personal footage. We're going to talk about the life history of the bobcat, uh, some, some of its prey species that it feeds on, how it lives. And also I'm interviewing a Ph.D. candidate at Virginia Tech who's doing a study on bobcats and looking at corridors and travel. So stick with us. Enjoy the footage you're about to see. Uh, some of it pretty rare. Uh, and also learning a little bit more about the bobcat. The bobcat is the only native feline species in Virginia. It is a medium-sized cat with a total length of 24 to 40 inches and weights of 10 to 25 pounds. Large females can surpass 20 pounds and occasionally males are found weighing over 30 pounds. Bobcat primarily a nocturnal animal, also can be seen during daytime hours, especially during hunting, like this opportunity that was missed after a gray squirrel. His lucky day, perhaps. Let's switch gears a little bit and look at this interview of Nicole Gorman, who's a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech recently, doing work with bobcats. I'm Nicole Gorman. I'm a PhD candidate and graduate researcher in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> My research interests are um, animal movement, habitat selection, and the individual variation within animal populations um, in those behaviors. I also aim for my research to be applicable to uh, managers and stakeholders so that we can use the information from my research in conservation um, in the real world on the ground. And my dissertation research is on wildlife corridors and functional habitat connectivity um, facilitate animal movement throughout these mixed-use environments that um, in reality include public land, private land, um, towns, and all kinds of different habitats that we may think of as typical wildlife habitat, but also um, we're now realizing that a lot of mixed-use areas and working lands are just as much wildlife habitat as kind of a classic forested national park or something like that. Bobcat research to inform where bobcats are actually moving in reality, and we hope that by protecting these corridors in between essential habitat, we can also protect those movement areas for um, many other mammal species or any other animal species because bobcats can be so generalist and flexible in the areas that they move. Their habitat may reflect habitat for many other species and hopefully um, have kind of greater conservation implications than just those four bobcats. <clears throat> so I'm taking um, animal behavior and landscape ecology concepts and trying to build that into wildlife corridor modeling frameworks where I can create a an improved wildlife corridor modeling that other people can use to designate wildlife corridors for other animals in other areas. But then also the results of my work, I hope, can inform bobcat and black bear and other animal um, conservation throughout the Blue Ridge and Piedmont regions of Virginia. Bobcats are a great study species for this type of research because they are wide ranging. They can travel hundreds of miles. So throughout their travels, they can indicate which types of habitats they're willing to use. They can have um, a range of behaviors like classic home ranges, but also be transient. Another study I found from 2019 by McNitt looking at home ranges of bobcats showed the male bobcats had home ranges three times the size of females. Some 13 square miles uh, were observed in some home ranges for males. 
The reason for this variation mainly included the males moving greater distances to patrol and mark territories and move between multiple female home ranges. In contrast, the females restricted their space to an area just large enough to acquire sufficient prey to maximize reproductive success, both to conserve energy and remain near young. There are also habitat generalists, so you'll find bobcats in forests, wetlands, grasslands, edge habitats, farms. Um, we used to think of them kind of just as like a forest specialist. They were away from human um, landowner permissions for bobcat trapping, for collaring and tracking, um, and just getting people more interested in conservation because they're curious about what such a cryptic species like a bobcat is up to. Um, landowners were willing to have um, myself and technicians come to their property every single day and kind of disrupt their routine to check these traps, as well as have uh, kind of gross smells in the form of lures and rotting meat that we eat to um, bait the traps that are attractive to bobcats, but not so much humans. What they're up to in their own backyard when they, some people don't even realize um, how close bobcats live to where they are. So one thing that I found both in my previous research in Illinois and in Virginia is how much bobcats do use farmland, working lands, and that edge habitat. Some of the biggest challenges are bobcats themselves. They are super um, smart and cautious. And even when you put all kinds of great stuff like scents, visual lures like feathers and cat toys, even um, shiny things, bobcats will, you know, 95% of the time peek inside the trap and then just walk away. And they might do that 20 times before they actually go in. I have tested in my five years of bobcat trapping a huge variety of baits, just roadkill deer, rabbits, squirrels. Um, but something that I found to be the most successful is ducks and geese. Um, the bobcats just love that fatty waterfowl um me and that is what I've always been super grateful to have hunters donate um pieces of duck carcass or even wings so also switching baits after a while is really effective too and then I also use um bobcat gland lures and other predator lure scents that are traditionally used for trapping so this is um a classic cage trap that's big enough for bobcats. Um, they typically like it to be pretty narrow in width and then a little bit taller in height because it gives them um, a sense of comfort to actually go into and they feel like they have enough room to explore. And it just has a pedal on the bottom that's triggered when the bobcat gets deep enough in the trap to get beyond the door and they're super safe and secure within the trap. We also cover it with a tarp so it's protected from wind, rain, other elements, um, and even other animals that might walk by. And then we also disguise it with uh, sticks and leaves or grasses, kind of whatever's in the area um, from the outside, which gives better protection and also makes it look a little bit more natural to the bobcat. Check the traps each morning um, on the dots so that a cat is only in there from overnight to the morning, not not too long so that they're not um, too dehydrated or uh, freaked out for so long, which involves um, a drug injection so that the cat is asleep the entire time so that we can be safe and the cat can be safe as we're handling it. Um, typically, it's only under for about um, an hour and our capture takes about a half hour. We wait for a while for the drug to take effect. The GPS collar on, that's the number one priority, but we take a lot of other physical and demographic data while we have the bobcat. So we look at its 
sex and get uh, an estimate of their age, whether they're a yearling, a younger adult, or an older adult, a sample of their whiskers, a little um, punch of tissue from their ear, so we have a genetic sample. And then we also put on ear tags that so that the bobcat can be identified even if the collar falls off and take a lot of different measurements and weigh it um, and even take a fecal sample to see what they've been eating recently. And um, a blood sample would we, would we could get a chance to that gives us some health information. And so there's a lot that goes on while the cat is actually down and while we can collect the data. Um, and then once we're all done, we um, put the cat back in the trap and reverse the drug. And it'll be safe in the trap for um, however long it takes the cat to wake up. And uh, So you don't actually need a like harvest trapping license because um, the animal is just going to be mm-hmm. released alive. But every... Um, research project that handles any animal species requires um, the handling protocol to be approved by an animal ethics board. So mine is located at Virginia Tech. So there are um, scientists and veterinarians that go through it and make sure that um, everything that we plan to do will minimize harm um, and is absolutely necessary. And then a secondary step is, yeah, getting approval from DWR to do um, animal handling research, but that's a completely different from actual um, trapping and harvest. But they'll eat anything really that's small enough for them to catch. So that includes um, a lot of mice, moles, squirrels, rabbits, sometimes deer fawns, birds, so, you know, songbirds, waterfowl, turkeys, whatever. One very concrete outcome that we hope is that the Virginia Wildlife Corridor Action Plan that was released in 2023 is set to be renewed in 2027, which is very soon after I'll be finishing this research. And I'm hoping that the results that I find will be able to be integrated into that whole statewide um, corridor plan that, um, you know, the Department of Forestry, uh, DWR, VDOT, and DCR are all working on together. They have a lot of plans on habitat conservation, but I'm hoping that this piece of GPS data informing those corridors will help Um, augment what they already have and that it can be integrated in a more comprehensive corridor plan for the state. So thank you for joining us today for 15 minutes in the forest. We hope you've learned more about the bobcat uh, as a predator species in our uh, uh, habitats all over Virginia, farmland, woodlands, wetlands. Stay tuned in two weeks for the next episode of 15 minutes in the forest.